Hare Krishna, very dear devotees, welcome back once again to our ongoing series on the glories of our beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharane Nivishesha Shunyavadi Paschata Deshatarane All glories to Sri Prabhupada. So, we are continuing with our series on historical Vrindavan, and today will be the final part, uh, part 10. Today we will discuss the different forms of art in old Vrindavan. And actually for this information we need to go back further than the time of Lord Chaitanya. We actually need to go back 5,000 years, because it was then that many uh, of the art forms, a few of which we see in present-day Vrindavan, were manifest during Krishna's pastimes on earth. We know this because such forms of art are actually described in detail in Shastras like Govinda Leelamrita by Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami, Krishnika Kamudi by uh, Kavikarnapura, uh, Krishna Bhavan Amrita by Vishwanath Chakavadi Thakur, Smarna Mangala Stotra by uh, Rupa Goswami, and Sva Shankalpa Prakash Dotra by Sri Raghunath Das Goswami. These were the scriptures that I referred to for this uh, class. And therein, we hear the gopis, in particular, were very expert in such arts as making designs with henna on the hands and feet, making artistic designs in, in kunjas and ni kunjas from various vines, flowers and uh, beautiful leaves, making jewelry and outfits from flower buds, uh, clothes, gems, pearls and, and stones, um, the art of singing in higher and lower notes, making garlands of uh, different colors, sizes, shapes and, and patterns, um, dancing in various dance forms, um, making jokes that will make someone laugh in ecstasy, I read. The art of saying something uh, in the most confidential way, and also playing with words in uh, rhyme and rhythm, uh, dis disguising Radha and Krishna according to their pastimes. Um, oh yeah, telling lies to Jatila and Kutila, <laughs> making puzzles and being expert in solving them, um, appeasing Sri Radha during her times of man, anger, and um, making tasty sweet dishes. Actually, I, I could go on and on. Um, for one Brajabhasi poet, he wrote that the number of art forms practiced by the gopis were equal to the number of stars in the sky, drops of water in the ocean, and particles in the air. One very famous uh, form of art in the olden days in Braj was the uh, Durupad school of music. This was a form actually of classical music. Of course, um, I, I was reading it, it, it was famous, or is famous throughout India, but there uh, were many places around Vrindavan where this form of music was actually taught. There were schools this form of music. Formerly many of the famous Drupad singers used to live and teach in Kamyavan. And uh, there was also a large school of music in Nidhivan. Nidhivan, which we've mentioned several times in the last few years, is in the area of Sevakunj. And a lot of devoted musicians used to live there, in that area of Sevakunj. In particular, there was a community of, a community of instrumentalists near the temple of uh, Radha Balaba, about 150 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> in learner circles, it is said that this style of music came from the Gandharvas, who passed it down to the gopis of Vrindavan, in whose care it evolved and reached perfection in glorifying Krishna. Tansen, the great uh, musician of Akbar's court, whom we've mentioned several times in our lectures, as you know. He was very expert in this style of music 500 years ago. And during his times, 
musicians used to hold large concerts of this Drupad style of music out at Govardhan Hill. <laughs> These concerts were actually very popular with the residents of Vrindavan, who I was reading would come from far away, they'd, they'd walk or they'd come in their ox carts to, to participate in such functions, to go to a concert at Govardhan Hill <laughs> with this classical music. Now this music was especially used in the service of the deities in the Vrindavan temples. Like during you know, festivals or any special ceremonies, it was, this music was played and sung. Devotees who were trained in this type of music would come and sing for the pleasure of the deities uh, in special ragas. According to the, the mood of the event, as well as the season, the time, or the day of the festival. There's various ragas which bring out certain emotions appropriate for a particular time of the day. <clears throat> and I was also reading that this classical form of music, it was very difficult to learn. In fact, a practitioner would continue studying it his entire life. And as a result, there's very few acharyas of this specific music school today left in Vrindavan. Only on rare occasions it can be heard in the uh, Radha Raman and the Radha Balabha temples as well as, a, as well as a few ashrams in, in Vrindavan. Now another interesting form of art was making um, outfits for the Vrindavan deities from jasmine flower buds by stitching the buds to the deity dress with a needle and thread. In our ISKCON movement, Pujaris, you know, we use glue for this purpose. But uh, we don't offer, the, I mean, we offer these flower outfits on big festival days, like, for example, Radhastami. But in old Vrindavan, such hand stitched flower outfits were offered every single day on summer evenings. Old Braj. <laughs> Every evening in the summer, you'd come to the temple and the deities would be dressed in a new flower outfit, stitched, not glued. Now another uh, very interesting art form was making fragrant uh, oils for the deities. There used to be a, a, a copper pot in which the priests would prepare these uh, flavored oils for the deities. This copper pot um, it had a long neck and it was connected to a copper pipe leading to a small container. So after waters and flowers were put into the pot and then heated with fire, the, uh, how could you say, the resulting vapors would go into that small container, which contained unscented oil. And after many hours of heating, the, the flower vapor would transform the unscented oil in the container into a, a slightly perfumed, oil. And sometime later the container was sealed and after cooling it would be placed in, in wet muddy ground. And after a number of days that container of oil matured into a deeply fragrant oil which was ready to be used in Krishna service. So they made their own oils. They made their own rose water, kewar water, the temples like that. So this was the art uh, of making oils. And uh, I learned that these old instruments are still preserved in some of the temples in Vrindavan. Now, another form of art which we touched on, I think last year, was the making of sanji. These are very uh, beautiful and detailed designs uh, of the pastimes of the Lord that they make on top of water with dry colored powders. <laughs> And instead of like, you know, a board or on the ground, they use these dry uh, uh, colored powders and they make designs on, on water, on a pot of water. And the amazing thing is that the nature of these dyes is that um, on these floating paint paintings, they never mix with the water. They're, they're floating paintings, but they never mix with the water. Almost a lost art. Of course, such designs were also and still are made on the floors uh, of temples as well. It's very popular in Vrindavan, Sanji. Another traditional uh, art form in Vrindavan was making jewelry 
from pearls, conch shells, gunja berries, vajayanti beads, sandalwood, and gold and silver. There was also um, a famous style of um, mukuts, or we, we uh, say in English crowns, for Vindavan's deities that they, that they made hundreds of years ago. They were known as Brajuratan mukuts, and they were all made from natural uh, materials. Another mukut I was reading about, uh, it was called a Leela Chantarika, and it was uh, constructed on a frame made of cow dung. They dried the cow dung and they made a frame out of cow dung, which is auspicious, onto which cloth was sewn and then uh, decorated with gemstones. The old style crowns the deities wore. Um, other art forms included uh, embroidery, work called uh, Jardoji, Kashi Dakari, and Tapaka. Jardozi, Kashi Dakari, and Tapaka. Some more details for you to know. Embroidery. And this, these particular styles of, of embroidery were uh, seen in deity clothes uh, and on the borders of dhotis and saris, as well as uh, shawls and, and chadars worn by the Brajabasis. Nowadays, um, very few workers and artists are left, artists are left to know this type of embroidery. There's a few at Loi Bazaar. I think devotees work closely with them in making deity outfits for our deities around the world, but it's slowly becoming a lost art. Um, painting houses with lime was another very beautiful art form in Braj, which was done by ladies uh, on their houses uh, on every Purnima or every full moon night. I don't think this exists anymore. They, they would take lime, different colors, and they would do beautiful uh, art, form, art forms on, on, their, uh, on their houses on every Purnima or full moon night. A very fine art or, or painting in those days was known as pichwai, pichwai which was used uh, for painting specifically backdrops for deities. This was done by very expert uh, painters of those days with um, permanent colors on, on fabrics. Now in modern times, of course, many of you know that these pichwai paintings are available, especially in, in Jaipur. They're being mass produced now as a business, but the quality of such paintings is nothing like what the famous artists of the past did just for Vrindavan's deities. Uh, those Pichwai paintings are found now only in museums, like I've seen them in Bharatpur, I've seen them in a, in a museum in Delhi, I've seen them in the city palace of Jayapur, they're just magnificent. And I think some of them are also found in private collections. Different types of pitchwai than we, we see these days. And I was reading that uh, making jewelry from silver coins uh, mixed with a little bit of gold was also a popular art form in Vrindavan in the old days. An example is that women and men used to wear these coins as pendants around their necks and they wore smaller coins uh, in their ears as, as studs. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, many of these traditional and rich art forms are slowly becoming extinct. Uh, the Vaishnav poet Garib Das, he once wrote, O oh, beautiful maiden of Braj, Shri Radhe, please return the roots of that old Vrindavan to me, where I can dive deep into the ocean of that sweet love of yours. Wow. But of course, eternal Vrindavan is and will always be decorated, you could say, with these evergreen and ever fresh uh, art forms, rituals, languages, poetries, scriptures, cuisines, and architecture that we've described and these 10 lectures in the series of historical Vrindavan. And one day, with purified vision, we'll be able to see it. By Prabhupada's mercy, we can discover it. 
I was remembering that uh, one time my godbrother Guru Das, while in Vrindavan, he said to Sridhar Prabhupada, how did he put it? Sridhar Prabhupada, I still don't see how this is as good as Goloka Vrindavan. He was in Vrindavan, so he's looking around. He said, Sridhar Prabhupada, I don't see how this is as good as Goloka Vrindavan. So Prabhupada replied, uh, then you must try to rediscover Vrindavan. That you must do. It is a question of consciousness. The real Vrindavan is there in your own heart, hiding herself from you. So we have to rediscover Vrindavan. And of course, we all hanker to go to that eternal Vrindavan, Goloka Vrindavan, at the end of our present lives. That's what we're working for. Let us say that's what we're serving for, by Prabhupada's grace, to go to that eternal Vrindavan. And in that mood, I would like to end this series. <laughs> we have more series. And I would like to end this series with a poem by uh, Surdas, in which Uddhava, um, his, his eyes full of tears, is addressing Krishna. It melts the heart. Uddhava says, Oh my dear friend, my heart is hankering for residence in Vrindavan where vines dance with the melody of the sweet-smelling air, where the heart laughs in ecstasy, where every pleasure that one can imagine resides in the sacred dust, where the days and nights pass in satisfaction and no worries disturb one's mind. My dear friend, please take me to Vrindavan, where my heart resonates with the twinkling sound of the ankle bells of Braja's gopis. And thus we finish this series. I hope this series has deepened your devotion for Sri Vrindavan Dham, and we'll continue with something. I still have to do some more research, but we'll continue uh, next Friday. It's been such a pleasure delivering this a specific series of lectures on historic Vrindavan. Thank you so much. All glories to Sri Prabhupada, again, the revealer of the Dham. Shri Shri Gaurani Thai Ki, Shri Shri Krishna Balaram Ki, Shri Shri Radha Shama Sundar Ki, Vrindavaneshwari Shri Mati Ki, Mayapur Dhamma Ki, Shri Shri Gaurani Thai Ki, Shri Krishna Sankirtan Yagya Ki, Back Home, Back to Godhead, Goloka Vrindavan Dham Ki, Gauri Premanandi, Jai Jai Sisi Radhe Sham. Hare Krishna. See you soon.